welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk, and this is the show about all things making music. On today's show, I have Tim Smolens. Tim is a musician, producer, composer. I found him via his YouTube channel while he was talking about some of the chord progressions and theory behind Beach Boys songs. And I got to talk to him about his work, what he does. We went into a lot of interesting topics from the harmonic series to equal temperament tuning, harmonies, chord progressions, Beach Boys music, Soundgarden, uh, great stuff and lots of cool musical examples. He's playing his piano along the way, so we get to hear a lot of what he's talking about. I think you're going to really enjoy the show. Please welcome Tim. Hey, Tim. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for having me, Brian. So your stuff, um, I was telling you a little bit before, but just to reiterate and get us started, I came across your YouTube channel. Just the algorithm suggested it, served it up, it was talking about some Beach Boys chord progressions. I think Surf's Up and Surfer Girl were the ones that I saw first. And I was just, I was in love with the channel right away. The way you're dissecting the chord progressions and showing how, you know, Brian Wilson was able to take this sometimes relatively simple ideas and just turn it into magic. and. Um, some of the beauty and the secret little tricks he's doing, modulating and stuff like that. Um, so your channel is so good. And for anyone that's interested in music theory and um, how to bring some interesting chord progressions into their work, I think you do such a great job in helping people get there. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, cool that people like you are finding my channel and it is starting to grow and it's kind of pushing me in a certain direction of uh, the Beach Boys analysis was really kind of a small part of what I do. And if you said you've read my bios, so I'm kind of all over the place, but it's kind of putting this pressure on me. Like, like I think the majority of my subscribers are now like mostly in it for the Beach Boys analysis. Mm. So how do I reconcile that with like the hardcore sci-fi prog rock people that, you know, like my channel too. Uh, so, yeah. it's, but, but I'm happy to do it. I absolutely love the Beach Boys. It's been something I've been studying for 20 something years at this point, uh, even in the background of my, like, you know, music career where we did a lot of like very eclectic, uh, I'll say progressive, even though I don't feel like it is really that related to prog rock specifically. I don't know what else you would call it, but, um, I think the difference between what I was doing with some of my, and you know, my original group was called a stratosphere. My current one is called high castle tele orchestra, very, very sort of out there eclectic groups. Um, is, is that that music is, is pretty overtly progressive, but the Beach Boys are, mm. it, it's hidden. The, the point of Brian's music is not that it's complicated. It just happens to be complicated. It's not like, check this out. Brian's not sitting there saying, oh, check out this chord progression. It's so cool. It goes to so many keys. It's just beautiful. <laughs> it strikes the ear in this way that, that listeners relate to. And if you are geeky like me, and apparently there's at least 5,000 other people, because that's about how many subscribers I have now. Um, well, maybe one or two of those were my own uh, from my own groups. But if you are <laughs> that geeky and do want to pop open the hood, a whole universe is there for you to kind of latch on to those devices that Brian is utilizing, some of which are original to him and other I'm pretty sure he got from the four freshmen and groups from the 40s and 50s that he listened a lot to. That world is there. I'm a big person who likes to get one particular device and then pull it into my world and say, oh, I'm going to keep that in my back pocket. Next time I need to modulate up a half step, there's a really interesting way to do it and, mm. and kind of break down each device piece by piece, kind of like if as if it was a little flashcard that I could just pull out that one. Oh, yeah, that's how he modulated uh, up a half step in Girls on the Beach or whatever. But yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed the channel and it's really exciting to have uh, people um, watching the channel more because the algorithm is catching on to a couple of the videos, I guess. Yeah, and, and you know what you just said is a really smart way, I think, to learn. I When I first tuned into your channel, I really got the impression you'd had a lot of musical training and you've you know, gone, maybe you went to school, who knows what, right? And then I read your bio and, it, and you actually are very self-taught where you've decided not to take that road. And I think the result of what I'm seeing now is probably that kind of work ethic where rather than just try to absorb a million things and never apply it, it seems like you're taking these ideas and really getting to know them and then making them, yeah, like you said, part of your Yeah, and I'm not entirely self-taught. Like I grew up getting guitar lessons, so I knew some basic theory and scales. Uh, eventually, I think I did take a couple semesters of jazz arranging. There was this very 
uh, locally famous in Santa Cruz at a community college, a guy named Ray Brown, not the bass player, not the jazz bass player, but he was a, a jazz trumpet player who lived there, but he had this famous jazz arranging class. So I took a couple semesters in that and learned how to voice for big band. So I, mm-hmm. I can speak in theory. I can speak in, you know, if we're talking about harmonic minor or modes or whatever, but my main interest seems to be chords and, and building sort of you know, large chords and jazz type of extensions, but like placing it into pop and rock music. Hmm. Yeah, that's nice. And I mean, the music of yours that I've heard too is is really interesting and has lots of cool melodies, I think, as a result of a lot of that voicing with some of those like chord extensions. Yeah, a lot of what we do is, is pretty much... Um, like they would do reharmonizing in jazz where you take a melody and then change the chords beneath it. Mm -hmm. But my methodology is not always pulling from that jazz playbook where if, you know, you had a, a melody on top, you know, you know, that's a G seven, but what if I put a C minor under it and it turns it into a C minor major nine chord, Mm -hmm. you know, you Mm -hmm. know, just, just seeing which strange chords and I'll just try like five different ones above each chord. And then I'll kind of go through and see like what, what kind of makes a path through the weeds of that. And, and you, right. w- once you get to the listener is you, I'm sure you know this, but like you still get the melody that everybody's hearing. It's the same melody popping out, but underneath of it, there's just like this spooky sophistication that reharmonization mm. gives. Yeah. Well, that was a beautiful example right there. Just <laughs> suddenly went from kind of like, Hey, you know, kind of <laughs> normal, happy. And then uh, kind of almost like mysterious and, yeah, it's it's there's there's a million, you know, ways to justify notes of a chord, especially within jazz, right? Of of hmm. this note, almost any note. I think there's some joke, I don't remember what it is that you can pretty much hit any note you want in jazz. There's some way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard the thing like you do it once, it's a mistake. Do it twice, it's jazz. <laughs> yeah, we used to have uh, the saxophone player for my band of Stratosphere. He he was un- his name's John Hooley. And let's say we were jamming in C minor. No, let's say we we're jamming in yeah, C minor. He, first note, E major, and he'll just hold it. Like hold the <laughs> note for like ten seconds and like, okay, he's not it's, it's what he means to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now we're just going with it. <laughs> That's cool. It's um, the Beach Boys are a fun example too for me. Also, in my life, you know, growing up, you knew them as a kid, and you know, Surf and Safari, and a lot of those songs, which sound simple, but are. And that's one of the things I love that he's able to do is he takes these ideas that and is able to take complex musical ideas and, and make them sound really simple. And you don't even realize he's doing all this tricky stuff with the melodies and the harmonies and um, modulations even. Yeah. But it's presented in this way because there are other kinds of music where you listen to it and you're like, okay, you're you're doing this to be weird and do these unusual things, but not the Beach Boys. And my journey with them was, you know, just kind of like knowing their stuff, but then being about like 18 and hearing pet sounds and then just being like, oh wait, because there was something that was clearly different. And then getting into that world and just being like, oh my God, I can't believe this whole time, like all this crazy stuff was going on. Yeah. The Beach Boys have this reputation in America as just the dorky, the striped, you know, red and white striped shirts, kind of representing that sort of like older Eisenhower era the, of, yeah. of uh, America where, oh, we're past that now. Ever since the, the hippies came in, you know, we don't need that kind of thing anymore. Uh, you know, never were seen as cool as the Beatles for sure, even though they you know, maybe don't have as meant as much output that's hip as the Beatles, but but it's mm. definitely uh, comparable. The best of the Beach Boys is easily comparable, or I think even better than the Beatles. Um, first thing, you know, I used to hear, you know, in some of those songs, the fun, fun, fun. They're not terribly complex, other than that it's interesting that you're taking a Chuck Berry style rock and roll and then putting this little four freshman vocal on top of it. Some of them there's really not too much to them, but the ballads are surprising like the the surfer girls and lonely sea and warmth of the sun um almost from the beginning brian was doing these extraordinary ballads with this harmonic complexity but the first time i got into them for real was um you know i was in this whole avant-garde music scene 
you know, Mr. Bungle and all these scenes. And someone's like, oh, you got to hear Pet Sounds. It's one of the craziest albums ever. <laughs> so until I knew it was like cool to like them, then I, you know, kind of dove in, started learning the chords, listening to the production and realized how similar it was, even though their music is not as abrasive as a lot of avant-garde and eclectic music. The production is like off the charts with with mm. complexity. And, you know, for, for me, it would be layering all this stuff because I overdub everything. But he had a, a, you know, a full orchestra available to him. And it wasn't a normal orchestra either. It's like, oh, Harry, we need a, a, a bass harmonica player today, and we're going to need three <laughs> cellos, a woodbox player, and uh, some muted trumpet. You know, like whatever he Bicycle was thinking horn. To, to paint the picture <laughs> for that. Yeah, he would order up some very strange ensembles, which is super mm. cool. I love that stuff. I got the Pet Sounds box set oh, yeah. around that time. It's like the four discs. And it's got all those little outtakes, and all you hear the conversation and just... You, they'll do a take and it'll be brilliant. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, cuts it off. I, I and, need you to stand a foot back more from the mic. And 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 can you when you hit yeah. that snare, Hal? Can you can you give it a little emphasis going into the chorus there? Um, I, I was blown away by how um, how good those backing tracks sound because the vocals. Let's face it, like when you mix, I've mixed music like this that's where there's seventy different instruments plus the vocals. It is really hard to. Fit everything into that stereo space. You have to right. kind of favor the vocals, right? Because it's vocal music. You're trying to make a hit, and the vocals. I don't. I don't want to say it the wrong way, but it almost makes the album sound more lo-fi than it is because it's taking up so much space. You you, hmm. you take away the vocals, and wouldn't it be nice? And suddenly you hear timpanis and accordions doing like a Chuck Berry type of. You know, this rock and roll, but that's an accordion playing that? I had no idea that that's what mm. it was. And you just hear everything in the mix. And it's a super, if anyone hasn't heard the Pet Sounds box set, the vocals alone and the instrumental tracks alone are a total revelation. Right. Yeah. They got both versions. You can hear just a cappella, which is yeah, amazing. unbelievable, you know? And then, yeah, just all that orchestration was incredible. Yeah. And the the bass player, I'm forgetting her. I think Carol Kay. Her name. Carol, Carol, yeah. Carol Kay. Carol Kay was the electric a lot of time. Lyle Ritz played a lot of the stand up, and I'm sure mm. there was a couple other people that came in and out on different tunes. Yeah. But <laughs> I, before we started recording too, I was I was admiring your basses, and I, I just picked up a Fender Six. I was telling you. Oh, and nice! Right away, like the palm muting on that. I, I don't think that's what she used. I don't. I actually have no idea. But I think um, she does a fair amount of muting I, when I listen to those, yeah, the especially on like muting. Sloop John B. Yeah, where it's almost like yeah. a lead bass on that song. But I do a ton of palm muting. In fact, I think it's my default way to play an electric bass. Mm. I play the stand up bass too. So a lot of times in my own music, I layer three or four basses in unison, and it just the cool thing about that kind of stack that Brian probably got from the, from Phil Spector was, was it just sounds like one instrument, but it's like an instrument that right. doesn't exist. So it doesn't take up a ton of space. If I do stand up, it's got that woody sound and then the, the muted sort of Hofner bass and then maybe a P bass and you put those together yeah. and you don't have to line them up because unless there's something horribly like, you know, off rhythm or something, but Back in those days, they wouldn't have been able to do any of that. So a little yeah. bit of that flamming actually helps it pop out a little bit as long as it's not egregiously, you know, out of time. Yeah, and it, it makes me also think of um, a great example is um, Walk on the Wild Side by Lou Reed. He's oh, yeah, got yeah. The stand up bass and the electric bass, too. Just they work really nicely together. It is something that's relatively underused. Yeah, there's usually one bass player in what, 90, 99% of rock music, I would guess. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's something I'm having fun with. That bass six, it's a it's a six string bass, but it's oh, tuned wow. exactly like a guitar. Oh, so it's I had no just idea. an octave lower. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so it's so like a it, super low E. No, it's tuned. It's the same low oh, E as oh, a, so it's the same bass. low E as a bass. Okay. It's just a guitar one octave lower. Okay. So rather than a uh, you know most six string basses will have like a low B and a whatever else they have, maybe a yeah. high B or something too. Yeah. Uh, this this is E-A-D-G-B-E. -E. Wow. That sounds so cool, man. I've been layering them together. Yeah, like some of the higher parts. Just, oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's beautiful. Just show me some of that so when you finish. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's fun. <laughs> I know. I'm like trying to tell everyone I know. Defender of Six is going great. <laughs> um, what is that like, though? I, I saw today you just released the uh, video on Black Hole Sun's chord progression by Soundgarden. So that's yeah. like, you know, much different. So much different. Um, 
As far as you were mentioning, sort of like the algorithm now, like people are coming to the Beach Boys. You know, yeah. Now, do you, do you feel like、um, that's the pull to follow that? Or is it kind of like, you know, do what you do? Because you're also talking about chords with something like Black Hole Sun, which is really interesting in itself. Yeah. So I, I, to me, it, 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 I, I didn't start and say, how do I reach different audiences? It, that absolutely wasn't it. Like, Black Hole Sun's <laughs> been one of those things for years that I've like, what the heck is that? that、uh, where, where this chord progression that I, I, I couldn't put my finger on what it is because it wasn't like anything I knew from any of the studies I did. And then when I you know, opened it up, you know, if you go look at the video, there's all kinds of sus chords, which, which if you don't resolve a sus chord, You know, if you just keep it as a sus chord instead of resolving it, you, you don't even know where you are harmonically. Like,、right. it's a very. It's, major minor. it's because in the harmonic series, what you're dealing with is the, the perfect fifth, which is the third harmonic, but the mirror image of a perfect fifth or going up a perfect fifth is going down a perfect fifth. So it's those three notes are kind of like this. Pivot point of all of like the the laws of harmonic nature, which are like not from music theory, but are actually just from science or physics. Which, but so you essentially have the idea of times three and divided by three all together.、Mm. Uh, I, I go over a lot of that on some of my videos where I'm going over like harmonic series. I don't want to get too much on a tangent because you have to kind of know the language a little bit. But that's the reason is you're, you're kind of creating a lot of ambiguity with a suspended chord. And a lot of times we, you know, use sus as a way to resolve. And then as it resolves, you know where you are. But if you just come right out and go,、mm. uh, You don't ever resolve it. You, you really put the listener's ear like, into kind of a little tailspin of, of where, I, where am I? I don't know what key we're in. Is it major? Is it minor? I have no clue. So the idea was not, yes,、yeah, so、I'm going to, you know, if I was going to do that, I'd probably start, you know, analyzing some Taylor Swift songs or something like that. But、uh, it's really, if something catches my ear、um, that, that's anywhere in pop music, I'm going to definitely start incorporating those. It won't be just Beach Boys. There's one song I was looking at this morning.、Uh, By Sublime, and everyone in my circles, I mean, Sublime's one of those bands. Oh, you have to hate Sublime because I hate surf punk stuff. <laughs> I always thought they had a lot of talent. They only had like one record or something, but there's one song called Pool Shark that has like 10 key changes in it. And I don't know if the guy、yeah. was thinking that or what, but to me, it is unbelievable the way that he switches keys so many times. I'm like, I am definitely doing that song. And it's not just to try to get popular, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that pull with Sublime. It's not the music, it's more the people. <laughs> I, I, yeah, and to me, I'm kind of at an age, I'm 46、silly. now, where, where there、yeah. would have been a time where I hang on to like, what's hip and what's not. And there's、right. plenty of things that I would almost consider guilty pleasures now, where I'm just like, oh, sorry, I think that was pretty good.、Yeah. I, I don't, it's not based on how popular, or how cool it was, but there was definitely a time in my life where I was susceptible to that type of thinking. Yeah. With、um, Black Hole Sun, and you know, it makes a lot of sense too, now that you're talking about it with the suspended chords and not knowing where you are. And if you re remember that video that they had, it's、so、very dystopian.、Bizarre. Yeah, very dystopian. Yeah, and, and, I hinted out of the video, there's definitely some occult references in there that Chris Cornell 100% denies. So maybe he, it was just word salad. But、uh, mm. if you look up the history of, of, of the idea of a black sun,、uh, I'm not even going to talk about where it comes from because it's a distasteful part of human history. But、yeah. I, I find it interesting, but、uh, I just don't want people to get the wrong idea. But there, there's, there really seems to be this real dystopian theme running through that. Um, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what he's talking about. There's a line that I really relate to in there times are gone for honest men. And then it's talking about、mm. the sn snakes or whatever. I, I don't even know all the lyrics, but, uh, there, yeah, there's some very sort of stark imagery in there. What a weird song to be such a big hit too, right? Yeah. You know? Is that, do you know,、um, on guitar, is that some kind of alternate tuning? I've never learned how to、I、play it. I don't think so, because it's really just those arpeggios that everyone recognizes, right? Those like. Yeah.、Nice. And, 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 and that's, I derive the chords. There's no one playing the exact chords that I.、Uh, if I press share here, does it share? Oh, it'll share my screen or what? No, I、uh, it should share the screen, yeah. Okay. Because I have it in here. Like, I can just really quickly show.、Um, cool. I'm talking while I, while I do it here. Black yeah, I appreciate all this examples you're doing. It's yeah, like, I haven't、uh, used this、uh, particular、YouTube. program. So let's try <laughs> share screen. Oh. 
we'll try to talk anyone that's yeah yeah go ahead and you, this can, you can keep can asking me too. questions about because um, i yeah. don't want to you know kill our rhythm here oh maybe it's just a tab it wants to do i'll we'll try it later they can see the all the, i share all the chords on the video and black hole sun on yeah. my channel so go check that out cool yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that one because that was one of those. What that was like right when I was learning guitar too, learning music, and it was kind of like you know I'm learning Nirvana, I'm learning. Green who has day, some Pearl strange Jam. progressions as well, right? Nirvana's progressions are yeah. very lithium. I, I'm going to do that one one day for sure. Right. Um, Kurt seemed to. I doubt he knew any theory at all. I bet it was just the melody that was dictating things, and then what you know you can make. Mm different chords justify a melody that are not the obvious chord that you're hearing as the key center, you know? Right. Yeah. Black hole sun was kind of like, eh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> was deep, like, man. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. A, fa a fan at the time. I was I, like on the video, I said, I'm, I was kind of indifferent to it. I didn't say, Oh, I dislike this. I never bought the record, but as I heard it over the years, I kept going, what are those chords? I'm going to learn that one mm. day. And I never got around to it till right. last week. <laughs> yeah. But Nirvana is, is really pretty complex too. And probably gets, a lot less credit like you know i've i've heard people say things oh, he's not a good guitarist he's not a good singer who cares but i but i disagree i think he's honestly. a good singer i don't think he's the greatest guitarist rhythm's okay lead he 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 didn't it seemed like he intentionally didn't want to do a good lead it was just kind of a noisy but uh I, he I was like was a, a tone player you know like he was that's where i think as he a singer i think he's skilled. fantastic i mean butch yeah. vig talks about that he could overdub and you barely can even tell it's doubled he didn't want to double yeah. the vocals until butch vig said oh john lennon does that and then he was okay with it because of the right you know the simple sort of punk rock aesthetic would would say that that's cheesy to overproduce it but uh, i think he's a great singer and and to sing like that mm. without blowing out your voice like i, I my oh, voice yeah. would be out of commission for 2 weeks if i sang one of their songs even tried right. to sing it like that and it would sound like a a skinning a cat it's not really my wheelhouse at all yeah. to scream <laughs> there there's a pretty nice uh, breakdown of uh, smells like teen spirit by rick Beato. oh yeah i like he, rick he, yeah he gets into some of these like what the actual like voicings he's doing over these chords and yeah you know, he's like, this is crazy. Like, this is, you know, playing like how complex these melodies are. They over. are. Yeah. He's hitting little jazzy notes. He he doesn't know it, but he's on the 11 of the chord, you know, with his voice or whatever. Yeah. 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 But I guess it, that, that's the ear, you know, you just have the sense. For Sometimes ever. knowing less. Yeah. You can stumble on some, some cool notes that way. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, your band too. Um, I, checked out some of the music it, i love that you're really going for some of that at least in a couple of songs um the 60s like kind of big production wall of sound beach boys vibe um you're talking about seems, iss i'm assuming yeah it's, okay. she's a girl i think yeah. it's mm -hmm. one of them um where that one especially was quite the ode I that mean, was an undertaking yeah but people get all i try to like make a little disclaimer like you're going to hear you know the heroes and villains like vocal the the little uh, sort of barbershop doo-wop i use that yeah. as just the little the, the motif that i could incorporate into my song i think i used the trombone line a couple times in there and then the verse chord progression of heroes and villains and that's it, though. I mean, it's not a copy mm. other than those three elements I did take from it's Here's like a Villains. It's a nod. Yeah. It's a nod, yeah. So, like, but but it that song, I mean, that took me, like, a year to record. There's, like, hundreds of tracks and, and and uh yeah, it, there's part, it's part of a record uh, called She's a Girl also. That's the title track. So that one, uh, if people want to pick it up, can pick it up at timsmolens.com or on Bandcamp. But... The record is largely uh, Beach Boys, you know, influenced. Um, there's a couple mm. that are more just like strange pop music, but it's all pretty listenable compared to the progressive stuff that, that I do in some of my other bands. <laughs> mm. Are you doing these recordings at home? Or are you going to studios for that? No, I yeah. do it almost all at home. Um, although when I do drums, I'll usually try to go somewhere and track for a day or two mm. you know, if necessary. You playing yeah. the drums too? No, I don't play drums. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's one that's tough to get right. Yeah, I don't <laughs> even don't even try. I don't like pretending. I, I I like to admit what my limitations are. I mean, I'm I definitely play a lot of stuff and even piano, like I understand everything from the piano, but I'm not a great pianist. Like I I can't shred or play a lot of lead stuff, but like if you want me to hit a, a C thirteen flat nine chord, you know, I can hit it. Uh, it's, <laughs> 
um so yeah so bass is kind of my main thing i can play some guitar but it really production has become i think my main instrument because it it takes the most amount of time so that's what i'm best at doing is layering and trying to use effects plugins in a way that i can sort of mimic you know sounds that i have heard on records in the 50s and 60s which these days obviously it's still too clean everything is still so clean but like if you want a spring reverb you can get a great spring reverb like sky's kind of the limit you know compared to 10 Mm. years ago with with effects plugins you can really get some gritty tones a lot of the plugins i get these days are things that degrade my sound i I have so many it's yeah that whether it's distortion (laughs) or overdrive or tape emulation or some of those um ones that oh do you make it sound like an old vinyl and it's sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and they're pretty oh sorry my dogs are going crazy upstairs um <laughs> no problem uh, yeah there there's some amazing plugins that i use and i'm going to start doing some more videos on my channel that show kind of my setup for for all of that hmm. well i mean it sounds incredible you know what you've done it's uh it's so cool what people can do at home you know <laughs> like that it sounds you know i had to ask right so um yeah really cool stuff but yeah the capturing those sounds is it's it's interesting how um, my journey has gone, and I, I think we might have some similarities in this too, because we've used to fight against all these things with my four track cassette recorder, and um, I had a pair of ADAT machines. Me as too. You I had said three ADATs. Did. I made my first record in you high three? school. Three ADATs. Twenty four yeah. tracks. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> had the first ADAT in Los Angeles. Woo. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> That's funny. We, buddy of mine and I, we had gotten them off of eBay. So oh, wow. it was, this was probably around like 99, 2000, you know, that year. Um, and it was like, it was so amazing to go to that level. Yeah. But even still, like it, things have come so much further since then. It's unbelievable. We, we made a, a very complex record in high school um, as this group we had at the time called Don Salsa, which was definitely heading toward that experimental avant-garde branch of my music. But it was like, we were trying to be as extreme as possible. So the first song was 30 minutes and there was like 200 different parts of the song and we recorded it in sections and then ended up going to a mastering studio and having him just like fly it in on a dat tape to like until the, the cut was right like, right <laughs> oh man yeah some trickery there yeah <laughs> those machines were they were funny like in vhs tapes super you know, vhs literally. yeah yeah it's unbelievable but yeah. uh they got the job done they have a sound too they you know looking back yeah they kind of like, have a dead sound like the converters are probably pretty low um i was using mm. like some task cam board at the time i don't know i didn't know the difference between a great tone or not i just was it was more like the ideas i was doing and the layering yeah. to, i got better at engineering as time went on and i still don't know if i consider myself like a world-class engineer i can do some frequency carving and compression but you know when you go into a real studio with a legit engineer it's always it's always impressive to me to see what they can do that's right. way above me yeah that i started getting into that a bit too at that time and and one of the big lessons that i still think about a lot was that i kind of was slowing down a lot because i was trying to get all that stuff right and i didn't know what i was doing with the compressors and you know i had a compressor and i thought everything should have it and um no idea why just that's what you do it's and, confusing right because you use compression for two reasons uh you use it to actually squash it a little and limit the dynamic range but a lot of times they're using it like for the sound that a compression has from from, yeah. from pushing it a little bit of, of getting a little bit you know those those types of compressors that can handle more gain reduction and sound pretty clean so it does have a you know a, a, a framing effect where it just kind of smooths out your gain a little but a lot of times it's kind of a, a, a sound right that's why we reach for different ones whether it's a, mm. a workhorse like an 1176 or um one of the ones i use uh i think it's an emula- emulation of a manly limiter or compressor mm. it's a native instruments plug-in but i think a fair mu or something like that but I, it I, you can push it so hard and like it, it's like 10 mm. db of gain you're barely even hearing it but it sounds really punchy Hmm. That's nice. Yeah. I found my big lesson was to just stop worrying about that stuff because everything sounded so much better than it used to on my, you know, cassette tapes. Yeah. So, um, not getting so bogged down on that helped me get a lot of work done because I was just, 
you know, and I have to remind myself that sometimes now when I start working on a track and I'm, you know, trying to make like a kick drum sound great before I even have anything else on the track. Yeah. So how do I know what a great kick drum sounds like until I have other things to have it work with? Yeah, I mean, you kind of know what your default might be, and I, I can work from that way. But yeah, sometimes it is good to know how it how it relates to the rest of it. Uh, and I'm always trying to imagine. I don't know how I don't get this buildup of frequencies because I swear on almost every instrument, I find myself adding some air, like like a really nice EQ at like 12k. That's just one of those EQs that are just one button, and you don't have to think mm. about it. Because whenever you try to emulate those shelves on like a parametric EQ, it's not the same as they have programmed into something like a Poltec or whatever the curve they have in these. Um, SoftTube has a a, ta a tape plugin. It's just called Tape. But the mm. high end, they have this high end knob on it that is the greatest sounding treble EQ I have ever heard in my life. And you just turn it up and it's like, it brings out all that uh. air. So I, I find myself adding that to most things a little bit and then carving out some kind of boxy low mid, like like 220 or 200 or 240, somewhere in there that's just kind of getting a little bit crowded. But you have to be careful because you'll eventually get this buildup where it sounds just a little bit brittle because you're doing yeah. that. But almost everything when I'm just EQing something, you know, I'm just soloing something and being like, oh, what is, what's going on there? Like... I always find myself adding a little more treble than I would otherwise want to because I'm I'm trying to see how is this going to translate to everyone's crappy system that they have mm. at this time. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that listen right out of their phone. Yeah, and that's all you're going to do. I'm guilty of that sometimes <laughs> yeah, yeah. too. You know, when it's all I got, it's like yeah. all right, just put the phone on. And my music, <laughs> I, you know, like layer music that's very layered, it's even worse on a phone than if it was just like a yeah. piano and a voice or something. It really, I, people try it you know, at work or something. Oh, like, oh, he plays music. I don't go around telling everyone I play music. They find out and like, oh, show me something. They pull up their phone. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you're going to put it on that. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Like, it's like, uh, you're going to like watch a movie on a little screen too. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Like you're going to lose all that immersion and yeah impact yeah well, never gotten chills listening to music off the phone it's it's a, a pretty bad time historically to be a musician you know there's a lot of we could probably dive into it but it'd probably be a boring conversation of you know since it became readily accessible on the internet it's 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 we you know how many people go oh i can't wait and go stand in line to at midnight to buy that record you know and all the, these things that we saw i don't know how old you are but i feel like i saw the tail end of all of that that were yeah. where record yeah. buying was a fun thing and it just now it's like most people i know don't don't buy music it's it's just a very superficial part of their life in the background you know maybe while they work out or something or Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't even talk a lot about music with a lot of people, you know, I work with or whatever, just because I like <laughs> the stuff I, I'm not trying to be a snob, but it's like, I know all this stuff and like, they're trying to tell me about Taylor Swift or something. And I, like, I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to also to just turn my nose up at everything either, but let's just talk. I'd rather talk about the weather or something like that <laughs> as yeah. far as like, you know, if I've, uh, I, I don't mind if people like, you know, different tastes and all of that kind of stuff. But like, I just don't find most people are, are real connoisseurs of any music at all. Yeah. Well, I think like you said, it's everywhere, right? So you, you, you don't have to devote this, devote the same attention to it. Whereas if I put on my CD, even, even when we're CDs. talking CDs, I had to put it on, you know, and, play intentional and, yeah, you and make listen to the whole cd it's not a shuffled playlist it's right it's an album and um you know, go back even further with records where you got to flip them halfway or tapes yeah. um there's a little more of participation required so i think it got more of your attention and there was a time when you know before yeah. xboxes and cable tv and and youtube like, yeah. like that was probably the equivalent of an Xbox was getting a record player yeah. or playing the saxophone or like now people are so overstimulated. It just doesn't seem that exciting to most people to either take up an instrument and, and really practice hard on it or even to just be a, a real fan of music. So I, I just don't see a lot of passion for music in general. I think its role has become extremely diminished. Uh, and, you know, I can reckless. I'm, I'm a. I'm a major optimist, like despite like the unbelievably grim outlook, um, I, I, st I still see it as kind of a reflection of society. Like I don't I, like I like what else would you expect from a society that is in this state, but that music is a superficial thing for it in general, you know. So 
Mm-hmm. You, you look at uh, some some historians that would go through different barbarian tribes, you know, in the old world, and and they would write about the music that they could tell by listening to the music that they did. You know what kind of personality that tribe would have, and how rough around the edges they would be, or how sophisticated they were or not. So there, there, it's always mm. been a thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's a cool way to study a, a civilization or a, or a group of people, anyway. The Secret Lore of Music by Fabre Dolivet, fantastic historical music book. Oh yeah, Secret yeah. Lore. Of music. Secret Lore of Music by notes. French uh, esotericist Fabre Dolivet, F A B R E D apostrophe O L I V E T. Um, kind of these little essays he wrote. I I could talk forever about this guy, but I won't because uh, it would take way too long. But I absolutely love <laughs> his his work on philosophy and music is one of the things he he focuses on at times. And that book is a collection of all of his writings on music. Hmm. Awesome! I got to check that out. That You'd sounds like, like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I often wonder, because now we've got, like you said, so much to entertain ourselves, right? And we can watch any show we want. We can play any game we want. We can do anything. We don't have to be bored. I wonder if when I was 14, and we're going back to like 94, would I have been bored enough today like to stick with the guitar, to struggle through it and sound like crap and my, have my fingers hurt and, you know, have a lousy guitar to learn on. And if I could just scroll on my phone and get like a low, lower hit of dopamine, you know, to make me feel good compared to the long-term investment that it takes to learn an instrument. I don't know if I would. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 I see kids on my street trying to do it and I'm, I, I kind of discourage people from the guitar because I don't think they're going to have that year of resilience, which it takes to, to just get the voicings and it not be a torture where I, I, sometimes I suggest piano because you can at least just press a note and you don't have to struggle to produce a tone. You, you might have trouble with the combinations you're hitting, but I can just do this on a piano, on a guitar. It's like... They can't even get yeah. that idea of like pushing, you know, supporting with the back Shredding thumb that so yeah. that this front finger is not, you know, being tortured so badly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, guitar is, is kind of an easy one even compared to like things violin, like a violin. Trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, the, yeah. Instruments I would not want to touch for that reason, just because yeah. tone production is such a difficult thing. <laughs> yeah. I wonder. I don't know. Um, I, I, I teach high school English oh, as wow. my day job. Wow. So cool. I, I'm with like, uh, you know, kids that age and I, I look at them a lot and I wonder like, cause I know I'd be the same way as them. It, it'd be very arrogant to think I'd be any different. Like I'd be walking around like a 14 year old, like high horse. You yeah. Know? No, I want to fit in with everybody. And I, yeah, I just don't know. Like there's so many things for, that they are dealing with that we just didn't have to worry about. I think it's fair to say we would probably not be embarking on the same path. Uh, who knows which direction it would take, but um, it seems yeah. like there's more resistance to that now. It would be, it would be harder to do what I did, you know, that seemed like a natural path forward to me at the time, even though it was kind of a strange trajectory compared to most people. But for me, it seemed like the, the path I saw through the forest. Yeah. You mentioned in your bio seeing that movie La Bamba uh-huh. with, about Richie Valance and Lou Diamond Phillips, right? Yep. And that had a big effect on me as a kid too. Nine and years old, It didn't man. make me go into music, but it made me think it was cool. And it it was, you know, it's a powerful story, you know, what happened I still to remember the way they used um, Sleepwalker yeah, oh, in that. God, yeah, right, yeah. It, it, when that airplane crash and the slow motion and and that, oh. that's what got me lo- in love with 50s music was was just that idea of that you know it took me forever to figure out why because that's the it's the typical one six four five but he goes straight to four minor instead of four major yeah. so it's mm-hmm. oh. going so so many times we hear people go f- major to minor right it happens all the time mm-hmm. but but not as common is to just go straight to the minor yeah, it's it's so it's heartbreaking. Such an amazing chord. track. I mean, just the the the, the, the yeah. composition is great. The the slap steel or whatever it is. The um, mm-hmm. what do you call that? A steel guitar? What, why am I yeah. blanking on that? Pedal. That's not a lap steel. steel it's a pedal steel. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but yeah, I I, I, lo- I yeah. love Johnny and Santo and uh, so much music from the fifties uh, and sixties. And it's it's not 
there's there's some amount of instrumental music that's not as popular as the vocal music from the you know, whether it's like some of the surf stuff, the ventures, mm-hmm. or the tornadoes, yeah, yeah. or the shadows. And and I love I could listen to that stuff all day. A playlist of just like mm-hmm. instrumentals from the '50s and '60s and surf. You know, surf has this cool thing where you can take how do you say this like the melody the, the the composition does not have to be that amazing it's actually more about the aesthetic of the the tom tom and the surf guitar tone and the reverb coming right. out the the twin guitar amp uh where, where it can take a song that if i were to play it for you on a piano you'd probably be like oh that's kind of cool or something just like some kind of half corny thing and then you play it like in surf rock style and it just absolutely comes to life. So that, mm. that always fascinates me is how productions can elevate. Obviously you have pure composition, which is great. You listen to a piece by Chopin or any of the greats and you're like, there's not a single problem, you know, an error in there anywhere. It's absolutely immaculate composition from front to back. But then you get all these things like you listen to, whether it's something like Sleepwalk or, or, or it, it is a great composition, but but it's just as much about the production and the way they get those tones and the, and the aesthetic of that recording as it is about the composition. Yeah. Yeah. It's hand in hand, right? Yeah. There, there's a vibe. Yeah. Like those like twangy guitars give and um, it just I'm feels like- I'm a huge like collector beach. of uh, Italian film music from like the 60s and 70s. I have thousands and thousands of, of soundtracks, um, all digitized now. But same thing there. The production is so good that that you sometimes, it elevates a song tremendously. Where I mean, if someone had just played that for me on the piano, it would only sound like kind of mediocre. But but a production, mm. that's not the goal. We don't set out to say, hey, we're going to write mediocre songs and the production's going to be so good. But you, if you have the skill to elevate like that as a producer, it's only going to make your recordings that much better, right? Yeah, and you said it earlier, you know, the production is my instrument. And it it really does take things places. It creates feelings, it creates moods and atmospheres and environments. And part of, that's part of what I think music does is it takes you on a journey. Yeah. really a good handle on that kind of production stuff. You right. Can... And the, and the, inst- and the studio itself, you know, as people like Brian Wilson taught us and Joe Meek and the, the, it is an instrument in and of itself. And you can use it like that. Most people don't. Most people are like, we're just trying to record the song we played. But, but for me, it's always this journey and I get so caught up in the weeds. I mean, it'll take me two or three years to make a record and I wish I could slim down my process a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times the ideas that I, gravitate to it's almost masochistic that i know that it's going to be really <laughs> hard to pull this off and it's going to take me like I'm, I'm surprised when i finished an album because before i only had kind of a a vague vision i'm not one of those people that like i can picture exactly what i want like i i have some ideas about which way it can go but then i kind of start throwing stuff at the wall and thinning mm. it out a little bit and shaping it and you know like when i'm doing midi you know, and some of the um, stuff I'm now, let's say I'm doing like a woodwind section that's behind one of my songs and I've got like oboe and French horn and whatever. I kind of will record my chord voicings as little blocks. I don't know if you've done this before. And then I'll look at the little MIDI tabs and I'll start pulling things around so that they have all these scattered entrances. But I couldn't mm. have envisioned that scattered entrance just if I'm sitting there with my, you know, staff paper and pencil. Like I, I could, it was so much easier for me to just put down the chords that I want and then finding an interesting way to stagger the entrances by mm. eighth notes or something comes in early so that it's like duh, 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 and they all enter at different times and, and you don't go get so much blocky movement among your voicings yeah i think about it that way too and sometimes i'll even you know take apart a chord and put it to different instruments you know just give them individual voices yeah and it's for me i, I it's more like exploring I feel sometimes more like someone that's getting on a ship in the 1400s and seeing what they can find out there. Right. And, and it makes me feel them. like, like, I don't know, like I, I am not like super egotistical, but I'm also like, like, I know I've got some talent at things and I'm good at certain things, but when you, maybe this has happened to you, but when I, when you watch a, or look at a composition of something that happened before any of this, whether it's Chopin or Debussy, and you're just like the forethought that these people had that this is exactly what I want. And there's a, there, you, yeah. all the crap we get to do with 
editing it after the fact and going in and trying all this stuff. I mean, it, it is a luxury, but but they were just more advanced musicians or composers than we were because they were that talented. It was the same thing with like authors, right? If you're if they were writing their rough draft of a book, like the sentence would come out as they wanted it. It wasn't like now I go through, I have my text file, I try this word, I change this yeah. word and move this word over here. It's, it's a double-edged sword, right? It is cool to be able to do that. But I think as a result, I, I am not even in the same realm of composer that that we're talking about, you know, with the greats. And that's fine. Like I don't I don't lose any sleep over that fact. And I can do things that they probably wish they would have done. Or maybe not them. I mean, think about like what Brian Wilson could have done with this technology, they probably would have been able to finish smile if, if uh, Brian was able to play around with it in pro tools. Right. I mean, mm. the, the, trying to record the way that they recorded good vibrations, which are hundreds of different sessions and then cutting them together with tape in this modular style that was, you know, took what, six months to make that, that single, but trying that process with an entire record was probably a, an ill-fated conquest uh, mm. to begin with. Cause it was just, cause it's just so difficult. Right. But if he had the, the basic tools that we had now, like not even any of the plug, like just the ability to like cut it up and try it and whatever could have easily been finished, you know, in 67. Yeah. I guess that's why we get the term engineer, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> because it's so technical, some of that stuff. And yeah, but yeah, that does blow my mind. And I was even one of the last conversations I had on the show, Charlie McCarran does film composition and he was talking about how, yeah, you, you now you can have the video and you can watch it and you can play along with it. But even going back, you know, 50, 60 years or 40 probably even, um, they had to know what the orchestra was going to play. Yeah. Before they got hired and it had to work with the film. And then you just start thinking like, holy cow, like. You have to just have the idea, right? Before We're content yeah. now to kind of dive in without our ideas being fully right. formed, right? And, yeah. and being fully formed, it doesn't mean like you might have your song, you might have your chords and your melody or your lyrics, but as far as like how the production's going to go or how, um, how any of it's going to, you know, it's, it's unbelievable what people with less to work with you know, we're able to do as far as forming the ideas completely ahead of time. Right. Yeah. And I guess in those days too, you didn't get even anywhere close to the studio unless you were like at the top. Yeah. Cause that was precious yeah. time and money and teams of people. Yeah. You had the, the heyday and, and just, just as far as music, like I was thinking about scoring uh, films, but you know, just as far as music in the sixties, you had the wrecking crew in the 70s, you had more of this cast of characters that were not not really the wrecking crew, but all the people that were playing on like the Steely Dan records and just just these un unbelievable musicians that made a great living playing music mm. as as studio musicians that that they still exist, but gosh, not to the level that they did back then before you know before MIDI came around and people stopped caring about those performances of you know I want. Chuck Rainey on the bass and I want to bring in, you know, Larry Carlton on the guitar, but we're going to have Bernard mm. Purdy play the drums and whoever you could just get these unbelievable cast of musicians that it took me a long time to listen to some of that music and just listen to the backing track and, and be floored with the feel that those people are able to collectively get. I mean, it is, it is, you know, I wouldn't have noticed that when I was 20 years old of like, listen to the feel of that drummer. Like it, it yeah. just, it's, it's not something you think about. It's kind of a background thing, but now you could, I could play here the simplest beat played by certain drummers and you just stop and go, Oh my gosh. Well, it didn't occur to me how important that was until I got pro tools and I put all my drums on the grid. Like I and finally got my drum, yeah. you know, I've tried to play the drums, but you know, I'm not a drummer at all and putting it on the grid i was like finally everything's gonna be right in time the way it's supposed to be and you're like wait a minute it's sterile like, huh yeah what's wrong here it just doesn't there's a push it, and it, pull it, among rhythm <laughs> sections right there's a certain yeah. where if you were to map out the click track you'll find they're deviating within two or three beats per minute over a minute or two pushing and pulling in certain sections you know, I don't know if drummers consciously lay back certain elements of the kid, if the hi-hat lays back or if the 
the bass lays back or pushes and that, that, you know, I think each, each group is different and that's what gives it that characteristic style. But there's also that, that the mysterious element of swing, right? Is we tend mm. to think of swing as either straight eights, da, 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 or completely swung to, do 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 do. But when you go in and quantize, right, you can go, you can do 20% swing or 15% swing. And that doesn't sound swing at all. There's, it sound, right. doesn't sound the slightest bit swing. And if you were to break down some of these, these, you know, beats from the greats, you're going to find they're swinging in various amounts, uh, with, unconsciously. They're not thinking about it at all, but that's mm. just very, very little music is really truly straight eighths. Yeah. And I've done some stuff where I've taken like, um, songs I love, just great songs, put them into my session and then just make markers where the parts change just to give yeah. myself like arrangement ideas, you know, like little templates for arrangements. Like, okay, the verse one here for four bars and then we had another little interlude or whatever it is, right? And um, I was really surprised, especially um, with the Beatles on, you know, they don't line up for very long on the grid. And like, they're so much faster at the end, they're so much slower. And it'd be like five to 10 dBs, um, BPM sometimes. Yeah, it's crazy. And I mean, I, it, I regard Ringo as like, he's my favorite drummer. I he's just think pretty he, amazing because because he has a person, he might have been the first drummer with a personality where you just noticed. And, and some of his stuff is so simple, but like, it is so innovative yeah, too, because no one had done a beat like that. Um, no, Ringo, Ringo is super, super amazing. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, they have it so doesn't stay straight, right? The click, bre the, the click, breathe, the, 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 and so when you do a sterile click track, it's like, you're making techno music. I, I've found these ways where on, on the last, you know, progressive album, we made a high castle tele orchestra. It's called the egg that never opened. It's that, um, that record right there <laughs> with the egg that's broken there. Um, nice. that's the vinyl version, but I, I found ways to, um, take a conductor so I'll take it or a, a, a tempo map from some conduction performance, conductor's performance of some orchestral thing, and all the ups and downs of the speed ups and slowdowns, and then I'll apply that to my own grid, and we're playing like cool. music with drums over it. So it, so it breathes in this way that that is like fermatas, like you would have in an orchestra. To me, it's just very boring when you don't have stuff like that. There's this one waltz we had that was like this cover of some strange like german mechanical music museum piece hmm. um and and the, the it's a waltz but it has it's constantly breathing so like just mapping out the click because i like to have everything on a grid because it's easier to edit but it can be a grid that has a dynamic click on it yeah it's it matters you know i was even fooling with this last night i have a three-piece garage band you know two other guys nice. and uh I play the guitar, but every once in a while we switch instruments, you know, and I'll get on the drums and just fool around. And I was thinking a lot of Smells Like Teen Spirit again, actually, because when Dave Grohl does those big hits at the beginning of the chord, they're like late. Or whatever. Boom, 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 boom. It's a little bit like behind. And I was playing around with that when we were jamming and it trying to hit the chords a little bit behind. As soon as I started doing that, the guys in the band started rocking back and forth. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, I'm trying, as, when I'm playing drums, I'm just desperately trying to keep time, yeah. you know, but when I started playing with that, it was so funny how the sway happened, you know, with the guys in the band. And it's just like, look at that, you know? Well, if this you think little, about our internal clock, been, right, is, is we have a, a, I'm always fascinated with the heart, right? The heart's beating at a certain BPM. Yeah. Have you ever taken yeah. a microphone up and recorded it and then pushed up the uh, frequencies? You can actually hear it like loud and clear and uh, tempo never, and everything. No. You could map out a click to your heartbeat, but but you have the variability of, of you know, when you're walking and it's going up a little or even just being a little anxious about something. And so so we're never sitting here at like 65 beats per minute is, is we yeah. live in a fluctuation of tempo that's, that's yeah. resonating from the core of our body. So I, I think those tempo fluctuations are, are more natural to us than the, the, you know, straight click track that never changes. Yeah. I just got this, uh, Fitbit for Christmas this year. My wife got it. And, um, I, I'm really surprised at how much my heart rate changes. You know, yeah. I, I thought it was a little more consistent, 
you know, but you know, I might be sitting there, it's fun. And then I, you know, just like move and like grab a drink of water. That's all took. Like, oh oh just, man, I'm yeah. now breathing heavy. Cause yeah, I, I definitely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very interesting that, that, and it's, it's also just a crazy thing. It just never takes a break. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Never and, takes, yeah. It's, it's, it's there, there's something does. very musical about a heartbeat that I, I think is kind yeah. of underexplored. Like I, it's some stuff I'm working on in the background where I do music with like, <laughs> That that's in pure tuning, like according to the harmonic series, where every fifth is tuned, yeah. or fifths are pretty close in equal temperament, but major thirds are a disaster. They're fourteen cents off. They're fourteen cents sharp in equal temperament compared to the harmonic series. The fifth harmonic creates what we call the major third, and the third harmonic creates what we call the perfect fifth. So those two are actually reversed in the harmonic series. Which, for those who don't know, if you play one note on an instrument, there's actually an infinity of notes ringing out in that in the ratio of one over one, which is the note you think you hear, but also in diminishing two over one, three over one, four over one, five over one, six over one. You can look at it on an oscilloscope, but they're kind of diminishing to infinity. But the prominent notes are the one over one and the two over one, which are just octaves of each other. It reinforces that one note you think you hear, but you can derive true tunings from that, which equal temperament, which is the system we use, which is uh, 12 notes equally divided in an octave, which is really more of a mm. convenience than anything. It's a way you can play in 12 keys and be equally out of tune in all the keys. But right. if you take it back to, you know, Indian classical music, they, they tune, you know, I don't think they're thinking intellectually like this of maybe they are, but like in terms of ratios and things like that, um, you get microtonal music that's like, you know, in Persian music and things like that, but you can make music that, that is truly in tune. And it sounds the the sound is there are notes that you wouldn't even believe because they just don't exist in our system. But but anyway, um, I forget how I got on that tangent, but uh, the, the major thirds are, that's significantly sharp. And, and let's not forget major and third is the note of beauty. So, so if you're 14 mm. cents sharp on the note of beauty, if I were to play this major chord and then sing, you actually are gonna tune to the bass with that five over one ratio, even though you're not thinking that, you're just thinking what's in tune. And that's how powerful that resonance is of the harmonic series, is, is even though there's a note ringing out 14 cents sharp in the middle there, mm, here it's a, it's a different note. And you can, you can produce it on a cello or a guitar harmonic. You can hear where the real thing is, but uh, it's a whole fascinating branch of music that is very hard to do because you have to play on fretless instruments or tune synthesizers, and you can't do a bunch of chord progressions because they're not going to be in tune. So right. you can do some. <laughs> when I was in college, I took a Bach class wow. and they brought in a harpsichord tuned to, I Just think they call it mean, mean tone. Mean, yeah. Well-tempered or whatever mean tone yeah. yeah and he played something in like a and it was like beautiful and then he's like oh, i'm gonna play in g and it was like terrible all out of tune it sounded awful yeah and that so, led us to the discussion of the well-tempered clavier so yeah Bach all of did. those tuning systems that pianists uh, piano tuners use are ways to try to compensate for that problem that i'm describing right. is that you can't equal you can't put 12 notes equally spaced out from each other and expect to be in tune like our system is actually it's pretty good in regard to perfect fifths that's only two cents off but that major third is a disaster and the dominant seventh is actually 31 cents off which is a complete disaster it just admit that's why it's a tension chord for us a dominant seven or if i were to some other time I'll tune my synthesizers down. I can produce all those tones or I can play them on cello too. Um, but but we, we've become so accustomed to that tuning that it does sound in tune to our Western ears. And, and in fact, if I were to show you the right notes, you would probably think they sounded weird. Like they, it takes mm. a little bit of getting used to. This is what I'm going to say the next time I'm singing out of tune. <laughs> like, well, it's actually it's not actually a true tune, you know, uh, seventh it, harmonic. Yeah, this is 14 cents sharp here. <laughs> That's where it's supposed to be. <laughs> I like, you know, why I like cents though, because uh, they say there's 1,200 cents in an octave, right? So 100 cents between each semitone. Because since since there's a hundred per semitone, when I say cents, we're actually expressing what percent it's off, also because it's out of a hundred. So mm. if I say it's 14 right. cents off, it's 14% off. So never thought it, about that, but it gives right. you yeah. a good yeah. uh, gauge for how out of tune something is uh, on equal temperament mm. versus true tuning or just intonation as they call it. 
A lot of times when I'm playing around with synthesizers and tuning oscillators, I go about like 8%. Then and that sounds good. Like, you could you could do it eight yeah. percent in both directions, right? And just get a fat yeah. like a yeah. Real that that wide, sounds chorusing. fantastic to do. Yeah. Um, anyone who's interested in that, I have a mm. video called on my channel called um, Harmonic Science with Tim Smolens. I think I only have episode one out, but it's a pretty extensive overview of the harmonic series. And and to me, it's strange how this is left out of music education. Like like you literally don't learn the science of music. Music is taught as a practical art. It's taught, learn this. This is just true. We call this the major scale. Don't ask why. We just do. <laughs> like, like, there's no questioning what the source is. They don't teach you that the harmonic series exists, that when you hit one note, there's an infinite number of notes coming out of that mm. in perfect ratios of each other. And so we're, I think we're very separated from the universal nature of music. And, and we're kind of relegated to this realm of practical art, which is cool. It's like, do what you want. Anyone's opinion, you know, is whatever. But if you take this back to like the, the teachings of Pythagoras that have been handed down is this stuff was, was huge in the old world in different areas mm. of the world, the, the studying music and its relationship to the universe and, and that everything, I mean, I think science has come to that even though they, they can't necessarily tie it into music that I would bet there's a huge connection. You know, why does Pluto, you know, even though it comes inside the orbit of uh God, what's the, is it Neptune? The one right before it, I'm not very good with the planet orders, but the, yeah. the, the next one out, Pluto comes inside of it. And yeah. the reason that why they never collide is because it's in a perfect three over two ratio, which is a perfect fifth. So it's never there at the same time. So, wow. so this, this is stuff that has been, you know, considered by some of the greats throughout the ages and the medieval times, and then all the way back to the Greeks and the Egyptians, um, it, to me is an absolutely fascinating subject. And I'm trying to, on my channel and on my Patreon, I'm trying to, which is called High Castle Conservatory. I'm trying to reconcile Western music with science of music, which, which sci mm. you can look in any curriculum. I don't think it exists. I don't think there's any universities that teach harmonic science and that's just music as ratios and then tuning it correctly. The only thing we have in our music that is truly scientific, and this is going to seem kind of dumb and obvious, but it's rhythm. Like if, if you say play these four beats in this time, you play those four beats. Like that's just dry science. If you say play a major third, the only reason that's called a major third is because we've arbitrarily decided that a major scale is the source of everything. And I don't know where that came from, but the major scale is not the source of everything. The harmonic series is because it's because I can't play a note where the harmonic series is not ringing. It's impossible to play on any acoustic instrument uh, um, a note that doesn't have an infinite number of notes ringing inside of it. So that is science. But... It's really not, like I said, it's not, and you, I could imagine that if you could reconcile those two things a little bit, you would get musicians that understand a little bit more of the the foundation of music as far as math. Like people think of math as this dry thing that's just numbers, but you know, I could verify that through, I could verify if you gave me an oscilloscope or, or even a, I could draw it in a circle that the reason this perfect fifth sounds good is because it's a three over two ratio. <laughs> right, well, if you take a rhythm, three over two yeah. like that played on a drum and an, another drum and speed it up enough it sounds great it switches from being a rhythm to a tone it's one of the easier that. polyrhythms to do because i i've been in music where we play like five in the time of like stuff that is like really i'm not a good like multi-limb polyrhythm kind of person yeah. i'm always amazed that there are drummers that can do that kind of stuff but three over two is the one like natural polyrhythm that that most musicians can get a handle on if you just play it for them you play it for them they're like oh yeah that thing right yeah it's interesting and then becomes a tone becomes yeah. Yeah, that would probably make math more fun for like kids at school too right to just say like yeah check it out like look at how this is related uh, yeah, i yeah i think it's kind of a shame that uh you know that musicians are so separated from the actual science of what's going on in, in their mm -hmm. music. Cause it is very scientific and very mathematical. Like everything in music is math as far as the notes and the harmonies and the rhythms. And that's most of what music is. Obviously you have tone and lyrics and all these flavors we add on top of that. But the, the absolute foundation of everything we're doing is numbers, but, but we're not, and it doesn't mean we have to, I've been accused, Oh, you're over intellectualizing it. Like, I don't see any problem with trying to understand what it is. I mean, yes, it is possible I could go down some road where the music I made from what I was learning did sound maybe 
overthinking it or something, but it's not like a foregone conclusion that if you like learn what's actually going on, you're automatically going to make like dry, sterile music. But uh, it it opens, I will say it opens Mm -hmm. up. It's kind of intimidating because like I said, you can't tune, you can't play guitar unless I were to just tune to open chords pianos i'd have to tune I, there is uh synth synthesizer plugins that i can tune them and and even adjust via midi that like sends midi pitch bend messages so you don't even have to think about it you just program in what you want and so you're not thinking about what what the tuning is it's just sending it to your software synthesizer but it still makes music infinitely more complicated to try to be in tune yeah, Ableton Live is rolling out a tuning system in the new version that's coming out soon, 12, nice. and it's got all these different tunings and scales. And when you play your keyboard, it's kind of funny because you go to play the scale and you might be playing some exotic Middle Eastern scale where it takes you like four octaves to get to the next wow. octave. Oh, it's like a multi-octave scale. Like It's a whole bunch of them. And I yeah, think those are some cool. of these um, more uh, natural harmonic series types tunings are part of that. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, like computers can get us back there in a way. It is. You know, I mean, it, math, like have said. you ever heard a dominant chord tuned correctly? If you can imagine that that major third is tuned down 14 cents, but that dominant seventh is 31 cents mm. off. And it's a note that they, they did some study a long time ago that how many cents can average Joe here as, as even a different note. And they, they, they the study determined it was somewhere around 12 cents is where your average person can even perceive that there's a different note happening at all. And that sounds about correct to me, which is why it's interesting that that major third lies at 14, just beyond the border, just, just beyond where average Joe, or just within what your average Joe could hear. But when we're talking 31 cents, that's almost a quarter tone. A quarter tone is by definition at 50 cents. And and those are really just vague because, because harmonics rarely fall. I've got this chart here. I'll show you one day. It has all exactly the anatomy of where all the harmonics up through like 200 fall within the octave. Mm. Um, but most of them don't fall directly on a quarter tone. It might be 10 cents, you know, North or South of, of somewhere. But um, yeah, I think, think uh, there there's notes in there that truly don't exist in our 12 tone system that are super cool and exotic. And you do hear them in Balinese gamelan music, um, Persian classical music, Indian classical music. There's plenty of music that, that uses, you know, ethnic types of music that uses, uh, and I don't think they're thinking of it the way I am. Oh, that's the 25th harmonic or whatever. I'm just one of those people that likes to try to understand what I'm dealing with so that I can put it in my tool belt and, and use it. Right. And that's why I think it doesn't matter that you want to intellectualize this and understand it because it's becomes part of your tool, you know, and, and that's the beauty of music is it's, it is so much science and so much art at the same time. There's the human emotional side that goes to it. But like you said, it's also built on numbers and relationships. And you ratios. know, one way you could use this, if you just went in and let's say you were doing music that had like vocal background, vocal harmonies, and all you did was found every major third and just pitch corrected that one note down mm. 14 cents that would be it's not that hard to do like i use a i'm kind of a weirdo i use digital performer which i think only like movie scoring people use that but i've just used that I've forever running with that that's my daw uh it's yeah. kind of complex learning curve i love i love it i've used it since like the early 2000s but i there's a great pitch uh automation inside of there where I, it's not like auto tune or i just choose the one note that i want to pitch shift and and can move it and it doesn't have that annoying like auto tune sound mm to it so if i want to go in and just find my major thirds it's still tedious i'm like this chord c major who's hitting e but and you can see like you know who's out of tune who's in tune and you just could correct those on 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 chords you're holding or something like that and you Mm. would find that a a tangible effect in your music Mm. yeah that's that's amazing right Uh, i I think i think voices naturally do it i think the beach boys i mean the beach boys aren't perfectly in tune that's part of their sound is there's some flatness in there but they always would at least double track their four or five parts on top of each other at least do it at least twice but i think when you're hearing other voices next to you i think you will naturally gravitate towards those ratios right the five over four or whatever Mm -hmm. which is that major third as opposed to this equal tempered interval which is just an arbitrary you know equal division of an octave Mm, just so we can make pianos. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it does give us a lot of convenience, right? It allows yeah. us to switch keys. And and you notice how Western music, unlike, um, you know, modal music of, of, you know, Eastern countries and India and 
our music seems to be even classical music. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, keep changing chords, keep going somewhere else. Cause keep making it exciting, but whatever you do, don't stay in one place. Cause if you do, we're going to realize you're out of tune. <laughs> like I, I, I really think there's something to that, that the fact that we never yeah. settle in on in tune, it just naturally makes yeah. us want to be really harmonically adventurous. Yeah. Like a lot of that music has drones. And <laughs> yeah. It is pedal points and hundred percent. Yeah. They, they'll mm. stay there all day. Yeah. <laughs> really cool. Really interesting how our culture and our upbringing influences what we hear and perceive as correct and the emotions we put behind a sound so much of it is just what our conditioning is yeah yeah 100 percent um yeah and i'm i'm down to um you know um what i'm trying to say here like uh if you want to do something do a segment sometime in the future where it's like just i could zoom in on any of the stuff we talked about a little bit more and go into more and give you some like graphs and stuff you could show on the screen at the same time but yeah, uh, i would love that that would be a fun check out that education. harmonic science video on my channel and you're yeah. gonna see like some of the some, it's so much easier with graphs to illustrate mm -hmm. like what i'm talking about with some of the stuff so sorry yeah. if some of that was uh I'll put the link in the show yeah. notes too for people that are listening. Cool, I know man. we got to let you go because you're teaching. Soon, I have a so. class I got to teach. Yeah, online for uh, my yeah. music school, High Castle Conservatory, which is on Patreon, which you guys should come join because we go into all this stuff in much deeper than I do on my YouTube channel. So I'm starting to try to build a little community there, but you know it's hard. I'm I got kids. I work as a ER nurse, a graveyard ER nurse. So mm. got a pretty busy life and doing all this music. I'm just trying to fit it all in there. <laughs> Mm, oh, I can relate. <laughs> you have kids, but you, no kids. Okay, uh, you have a dog, and she's pretty easy. And uh, <laughs> but you know, it doesn't matter. It's still hard. Yeah, you know? it, it is um, hard, man. It's hard to fit it in. My I, job. I'm always doing as much music as I can get away with down here in the basement that my wife doesn't like snap on me. So it, yeah. I, I always find that, that line where it's like, is that, is that too much? I better get back up there. Like, yes, cause you know how it is. It's, I, I can't really get anything done unless I sit here for two or three hours. Like it's like coming down for 30 minutes is, is I might as well not even do it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you need to just get lost. <laughs> Yeah. That black hole. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thanks for having me on. I'm down to do it any other time. Like I said, we could focus in on, on any of this crazy yeah, random great. subjects that are somehow in my wheelhouse, but. Excellent. Yeah. And for people listening, um, I guess this is a pretty good taste of some of the stuff they'd get by joining and checking out your stuff on the Patreon and then the music conservatory. So I'll put all the show notes in there so people can find it. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to do this again because uh, you opened a lot of can of worms. And yeah, it's hard to get into them all. And I can get uh, you, yeah. you invited me in, in the invite to this to said you were you're cool with uh, being tangential. So I definitely took you yeah. up on that. Oh, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy we did because there's a lot of cool stuff came out of it. Um, so, but thank you so much. And thanks, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you to those listening. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton Live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The 5-Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music-making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also The Music Production Club where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like-minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.